John chapter 10. Let's go to the Lord in prayer once again. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, how thankful we are to be able to come together to worship you. Lord, we're thankful for all who have been able to make it out this morning. We thank thee for what you care over us as we uh, travel, as we went about through the week. Lord, uh, for the health that we have, Lord, we thank thee for giving us the desire to be here. Lord, for we know that not all these things exist in everybody, but uh, Lord, you've given us the grace, the strength, peace. Lord, uh, all of these things, we, we just thank thee for it. But most of all, Lord, even this morning, we thank thee. Above all things, we thank thee for your Son who came into this world and died for our sin. Though they were great in number, Lord, though we deserve none of it, died for our sins, and through Him we could have life, have it more abundantly. Our Father, we thank Thee that we serve a risen Savior. Lord, how happy we are today to know that though this world is in a mess, our country, the things that are going on, Lord, we know that you're on your throne. One day our Savior's coming back for us. We look forward to that day. Lord, even looking ahead, we thank thee that, uh, that uh, you've promised that uh, whatever happens between now and then, you'll be with us every step of the way. Our Father, we pray that you would be with us through the service. Lord, that your word be presented in truth, received as such. Bless the songs as they're sung. Prayers. And Lord, we pray for those uh, on the prayer list. We pray for those that, uh, that uh, aren't here. We ask that you be with them, those who are sick, those who uh, are away from us, those of our number that live at far distances, we ask that you be with them. Lord, we pray that you will be with uh, the missionaries on the field. Lord, we ask that you be with, be with this country. Lord, surely we'd have a revival. Forgive us where we failed you. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. John chapter 10, and this morning we want to begin with verses 27 through 30. This is our text here. He says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man Pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all. No man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. So I was studying. I read about a Scottish preacher lived from 1680 to 1754. His name was Ebenezer Erskine. I don't know anything about him except what I just read in my studies. But he visited a woman on her deathbed and he lovingly tested her readiness for heaven. She assured him that she was ready to depart to be with Christ because she was in that hand from which no one could pluck her. Erskine asked her, but are you not afraid that you will slip through his fingers in the end? She said that is impossible because what you, you have always told us. And he said, and what is that? He said, that, or she said, that we are united to Him 
So we are part of his body. I cannot slip through his fingers because I am one of his fingers. Besides, she said, Christ has paid too high of a price for my redemption to leave me in Satan's hand. If I were to be lost, he would lose more than I. I would lose my salvation. But he would lose his glory because one of his sheep would be lost. Amen. I'm going to bring a message today on the subject of the preservation and perseverance of the saints. We've been going through the doctrines of grace. Certainly we've not exhausted each one of these points. Could go on for weeks, I suppose, on each one. It's kind of just been an overview. But this is the final stop of the Tulip Doctrine. Total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and the preservation and perseverance of the saints. I remember several years ago, I was at a Bible conference. I believe his brother Willard Pyle was preaching, and he said, he said that we have the tulip, but the Arminians don't have a flower. I was a young fellow then. I went up to him afterwards. I said, Brother, Brother Pyle, they do have a flower. It's the daisy. We've got the tulip, they've got the daisy. He said, Really? I said, Yeah. He loves me. He loves me not. He loves me. He loves me not. You remember the little girls that used to pull the petals until they got to the end? That was, that was the determination. Whether their boy that they had a crush on loved them. That's really how the Armenians look at things. This fifth and final point of the doctrines of grace is very important. Commonly referred to as the perseverance of the saints, preservation of the saints. It's often used sometimes eternal security. Once saved, always saved. You hear that sometimes. People people will talk it talk about it that way. Brother Tom Ross said simply stated the doctrine of Perseverance of the saints means that those who have been genuinely saved by the power of God are also preserved by that power, enabling them to persevere in holiness unto the end. This truth implies that it is impossible for a genuine saint of God to lose the Lord's salvation and finally perish in his sins. And that's the key, isn't it? It's the Lord's salvation. It's our sins. Oh, if it was our salvation, if it was our works, if it was up to us, yeah, we could lose it. And we would lose it. The reality is we would have never gained it. There's nothing that we could do to merit God's favor. It's as Brother Ross alluded to in his book there, it's not just the preservation, but it's the perseverance and preservation. You see, our tulip has two peas. And you might think that two peas are in a pod, but this is a special kind of a tulip. A, a, a different kind of a tulip, as we'll see. Over in Proverbs chapter 11 and verse 1, look, look here with me if you will.
Proverbs 11 and verse 1, it says, A false balance is abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is His delight. I believe that this truth goes a long way. It's true in business, but it's also true in doctrine. You see, if you take perseverance without the power of God's preservation behind it, then Arminianism raises its ugly head and declares that a saint of God can lose his salvation. What, what did our text say? What did Jesus teach? What, what, did, what is so clearly taught throughout the Scriptures? It's amazing. When you get down, down to it, <clears throat> but even if you look at just that one text, and we'll look at some others here in just a few moments, but Jesus said, I give unto them eternal life. What's eternal? There's something that's eternal never the end. They shall never perish. Neither shall any man plug them out of my hand. <clears throat> my Father, He said, which gave them Me is greater than all and no man is able to plug them out of My Father's hand. You want a secure place to be? Sometimes I even sign my letters. You know, sometimes people sign by God's grace or yours in Christ. How about in God's grip? You can't get out of God's grip. Amen. <clears throat> it's a fun game to play with the kids. You know, my grandpa used to play it with me get something out of the bear trap, he would say. He have something in his hand and we'd try to wrestle it out of his out of his hand. We couldn't get it out because his hand was so strong. But how much stronger, and Grandpa had some strong hands, but how much stronger is God's hand? Well, I'll tell you, so strong that when he says no man is able, no man, he means it. Amen. He means it. Verse 31. Well, verse 30 says, I and my Father are one. Verse 31, Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Oh, how the Jews wanted to destroy him for teaching such a thing. And how many in our day want to destroy the, the, this system for thinking and all it is is it's a, a, a power trip. You see, if we're safe and secure in the Father's hand, then where's the power at? Where's the, where's the security at? Who's it up to? Who, who is God? If it's up to you, if it's up to you, if your security rests in what you do today, or what you've done, whether you've kept all the commandments, whether you've dotted all the I's and crossed all the T's and all that, then who's the God of your salvation? Who's the author and finisher of your faith? You are, if you have to do it all. But that's not what the Bible teaches. And so if perseverance is taught without the power of God's preservation behind it, then we've got Arminianism. But on the flip side of it, if we teach preservation without perseverance and holiness, then what do we have? 
we have something that's equally as dangerous. And that's something called antinomianism. And that's loose living. Somebody says, well, I have been saved. I'm in God's grip. What's the use? I can live and do whatever I want. And that's not right. You see. God has given, God has given us a book that tells us how we should live. How we should act. You know, sometimes we see those memes on Facebook. People talk about, oh, I, when this baby's born, I wish there was a, a, an instruction manual for life. There he is, right here. But why? Why? Do we follow this in order that we might make it to heaven? as a reward for being a good person? No. We'd all fail, wouldn't we? Or do we, do we follow His Word, do what He says, because He has saved us? Because of what He has done? You see? Antinomianism is is the belief that the gospel frees the Christian from require, requirement to the law, whether scriptural, civil, or moral. We don't believe that. We don't believe that. <coughs> even, even if you go back into the, the Ten Commandments, Look at it with me for just a moment. The Ten Commandments were never even required, were never ever, ever given for salvation. But look, look, there's a pattern that's laid down even back there in the Old Testament in Exodus chapter 20. God spake all these words, saying, I, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Did you catch that? Re redemption first, then obedience. Right away. I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And, that, and that's the pattern. That's the pattern for life as a Christian in this day and age that we live in too. No one was ever saved by keeping the commandments. Not in the Old Testament, not in the New Testament, not now. But we, but we follow the things that He's given us because He saved us. And we understand, of course, that there's some laws that don't apply to us today. We don't have time to get into, into all those things because, you know, there's, some, there's some, somebody that will come on, maybe on Facebook or on Sermon audio said, what about eating shellfish and all those sort of things? Understand there were some laws that were given to Israel as a nation that don't apply to us. There were also some laws that were given which were done away with in the New Testament era. There's moral laws which apply. There's civil laws. So uh, we won't get into all those sort of things, but Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. So we look at those things and we consider them and we do them not in order that we're, not in order that we're, that it, not in order to be saved, not in order to keep saved, but because we're saved. And so we understand that there's a balance there and understand that 
the Old Testament is full of grace, and the New Testament is full of law. And no, I didn't get those mixed up. You get in there and study those things out, and you'll find, you'll find it to be true. And so we delight in the Lord with the just weight and our belief and our teaching, rightly dividing the word of truth. And I, know, I can tell you right now, we're not going to get through all my notes and thoughts on this, on this subject. Uh, time, is, uh, time is running out on me quickly. But go with me to 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 23. 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 23. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are preserved completely and totally. Once we're saved, yes, we're, we're always saved. Uh, praise the Lord for it. Uh, we thank God for preservation. Uh, preserved blameless. What a, what, a, what, a, what a concept. Knowing, knowing that in and of ourselves, we're not blameless. I live with me, you live with you. You know that in and of ourselves, we are not blameless. So how are we blameless? Well, we're blameless through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. That's how we're blameless, you see. Over in the book of Luke, chapter 8. You see, 
in this parable we find <coughs> that there's something that is missing a lot of times with folks. In this we find that it's more than just the profession. Look there and you'll see Some fell upon a rock, as soon as it was sprung up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. Some fell among thorns, sprang up with it, choked it. Another fell in good ground, sprang up and bare fruit a hundredfold. If there's true profession, with possession, meaning if you really did believe in Jesus, the day that you were the the day that the day that you say that you were saved, the day that your friend says that he was saved, the day that your coworker says that he was saved, there's going to be evidence of it. Now the fruit, some, and we can look at other passages as well. Some are more fruitful than others, but there will be fruit. Amen. There will be fruit. <clears throat> Something. Something. Some evidence of a changed life. Are you saved? Some folks cling to a date, a calendar date. And that's all they've got. That's all they've got. They have no evidence. No examination of a life lived for the Lord. No talk of repentance. No change. If you go on in this parable here, Verse 11, he says, Now the parable is this, the seed is the word of God. Those by the wayside are they that hear, and then cometh the devil, taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. They on the rock are they, which when they hear, receive the word with joy. And these have no root, which for a while believe, and in time of temptation fall away. That which fell among thorns are they which, when they have heard, go forth and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life, and bring no fruit to perfection. But that on the good ground are they which, in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it, and bring forth fruit with patience. This parable does not teach that it's possible for a man or woman to lose his salvation. What it does teach, I believe, is that the only ones who were truly saved are those on the good ground. Others made a profession, but it was not true. Some folks appear saved maybe for a time but then it looks like they have what some term lost their salvation now one of two things happen but not neither of which is them losing their salvation understand that one of two things happen either they weren't really saved in the first place or they've backslidden now, backsliding does not mean that they have sinned away their day of grace. It doesn't mean that they've lost their salvation. What it does mean is that they have, they have gone into their own ways. Now, hear me now. A person who is saved is given a new nature, but that old nature is still there. And, you, and if you've been saved longer than, a, uh, longer than a few minutes, you know that you still battle that old nature. If you are saved, 
and you go back to your old ways, your old life, you live like you did before, and you can continue on doing that, don't be happy about it. The Lord will get your attention. Let me tell you, about the time of the cross, there were some things going on. Judas Iscariot had everybody fooled, didn't he? Everybody fooled, except for the Lord. Judas had a plan to go out and betray the Lord. And guess what? God didn't stop him. Didn't intervene. Let him go on out and do what he did. There were some other of the Lord's disciples that were also around that same time. They were in the garden to pray with the Lord. And what did they do? They, they fell asleep, didn't they? And what happened? Jesus kept coming back to wake them up. If you're one of the Lord's people, He'll come and wake you up. He'll get your attention. He'll keep picking on you. One way or another, He will get your attention. Through chastisement, through, through whippings, through poking and prodding, waking you up. But if you're not, He'll just let you go on. Someone make meet Jodas along the way. Are you, are you one of the Lord's people? <laughs> yeah, I am. I was saved on, here's the calendar date. Or maybe even I'm the treasurer of the church. I'm the, I'm the not to pick on treasurers, but you know. Uh, but I'm a member of the church. I'm this, I'm that. Yeah, of course I'm saved. No, he wasn't. He had done sold out for a bit of money. You see, Think about it. Consider it. Piece those things together. Examine your life. Don't grab hold of one side of this doctrine. And live recklessly. Are we living in the last days? Look, I believe we are. But I can guarantee you, without a doubt... This is my last days. These are your last days. We don't get a do-over. <clears throat> One of these days we'll all stand before the Lord. We can't say, well, but God, I was a member of a church. I remember the day. And I love that doctrine of preservation. And oh, I lived my life so recklessly, but you promised that I would never be lost. And we often think about those who go before the Lord and will say to Him, haven't I done this and this and this in your name? Well, those are the Armenians. But what about the Antinomians? Who go and say, but you promised never to leave us or forsake us. They're going to be in the same trouble as what the Armenians are, folks. Go through life and hang on to a promise that's not ours. It's very dangerous. But let me tell you, once we are saved and living for the Lord, oh, what a blessing this is to know that even when I trip and fall, even when you trip and fall, God's got us in His grip. 
you realize that about that same time as things were going on, Peter, Peter denied the Lord. Not once, not twice, but three times. You heard that rooster crow? Just like you'd been told it would. He looked the Lord. The Lord was already looking at him. Why? Because Peter belonged to him. You see, Peter was in his grip. Thank the Lord it wasn't up to Peter. He would have done messed it all up. How many times have we done the same thing? If you're saved today, you know what I'm talking about. Praise the Lord for the preservation and perseverance of the saints. To know, to know even the least of the saints are still a saint. To know to know that we're in his grip even, even when we don't deserve it because none of us do. All the way from beginning to the end. Let us not misunderstand this doctrine. Lord willing, we'll pick it up, look at it some more uh, next time. Uh, perhaps, maybe even I'll finish here at the 11 o'clock hour. As it is a beautiful doctrine to consider. One that is a doctrine for God's people. For God's people. A security for us as we trust Him to take us from the time that we're saved all the way till the time that our eyes behold him in glory. <clears throat> Brother Isaiah, would you